In the realm of online personalities, many wield their platforms to voice their views to audiences big and small. Yet behind the scenes, these personalities aren't always who they seem to be. Enter Caleb Maupin, a YouTuber known for his political commentary and communist activism. He has been dubbed the Spanky Tanky due to his opinions and the turmoil he found himself in back in 2022. Brace yourself because the reality is much more unsettling than his name implies. This is the story of Caleb Maupin the communist YouTuber who ran a spanking cult. I'll be skipping over the details of his early life for the sake of shortening this essay. You just have to know that he gained a lot of attention during the Occupy Wall Street movement and went on to become a successful journalist and host many events and talks regarding politics from there. Nowadays, Caleb Maupin portrays himself as an American patriot advocating for peace and socialism. However, his online presence clashed vehemently with the political spectrum. And who could forget this gem? Hmm. Burger King. Caleb Maupin's political opinions also led him down the path of being an author, with one of his most famous books being Bread Tube Serves Imperialism, which is nothing more than a book where he roasts people he's gotten into beef with online. One can tell that his intentions are rooted in spite and not principle since bread tuber H. Bomber Guy is not given any meaningful criticism despite being one of the largest bread tubers out there. With his authorship shriveled to the point where he writes full-length books roasting YouTubers and streamers, that's not even his most embarrassing book. His modus operandi with authorship seems to be adding a prelude to other people's existing work and passing it off as his own. Being a rather embarrassing author, that leaves him with one more thing to touch upon. His leadership. At the core of his misdeeds lies one of the groups that Caleb Maupin founded, the Center for Political Innovation, or as we will be calling it, the CPI. On the surface, the CPI champions anti-imperialistic ideals, an appealing notion for many viewers. Imperialism, for those who don't know, is the practice, theory, or attitude of maintaining or extending power over foreign nations, particularly through expansionism, employing both hard power and soft power. Opposing this might sound all good to you, but there, anti-imperialism isn't a blanket stance. It primarily targets American imperialism. This leads them to excuse other nations' imperialistic actions under the guise of opposing American dominance. In fact, look at this clip of Maupin singing the praises of China's leader, Xi Jinping. Ask anyone from Taiwan if China is an anti-imperialist nation. Fine. You shouldn't be reading Herbert Marcuse. You shouldn't be reading Noam Chomsky. This is what you should be reading. You should be reading the writings of President Xi Jinping. Uh, he's the president of China, and he's a Marxist. You know, China is the success story of Marxism. 1949, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. This is important to mention because from the get-go, we're seeing a pattern of misleading behavior to the point of outright dishonesty. But it turns out that behind the guise of advocacy was an alleged abuser. A Medium article came out in August 2022 written by former members of the CPI alleging sexual misconduct, lies, and manipulation from Maupin. We will be starting with Member 2's statement. Her name has been omitted by the article for anonymity's sake and the reason why 2 is coming before 1 will only make sense when we get to one statement, so hold on to that. Member 2 was 19 years old when she met Caleb Maupin. At the time, she was working as a tutor while simultaneously juggling college and paying for her own place away from her parents. Member 2 found Maupin to be a person who made her feel heard, as Maupin would treat them the same as anyone else, essentially doing the whole you're so mature for your age thing that groomers do. When they would hang out, Maupin would periodically bring up an interest he had in corporal punishment. Mostly the spanking part of it, though. Eventually down the line, Maupin divulged the fact that his interest in spanking was rooted in kink to member two, and even voluntarily said that he gets off on the idea of talking to women about their experiences with corporal punishment. Member two was under the impression that this openness was out of friendship, and so not seeing the warning signs in his behavior, continued to be friends with him. Eventually, she accompanied him to a CPI conference, under the impression that she would be able to make it back home in time to work her next shift, which for reasons mentioned before was pretty important for her to keep her job. Maupin assured her that everything would be okay, but it was not. He kept her longer than she anticipated, and so she couldn't work, resulting in her termination. Without a job and fearing the consequences, Maupin comforted her over texts. Listen to how much Member 2 downplays what she's going through to him, as she's under threat of basically losing everything. Remember on Monday when I said that missing my shift might cost me my job? I was unfortunately correct. I will call you when I get home tonight. Okay. I'm really sorry, Caleb. I'll do my best to find another job. Why are you apologizing? You're doing your best. I'm really sorry this happened. 
I will try to help you however I can. You will be okay. You are safe. How will your dad's credit being affected prevent him from making mortgage payments? He's on a mortgage that has some kind of variable rate, so if his credit goes down, his payments go up. I don't know the exact particulars, but it was one of those predatory mortgages in the early 2000s. Well, you should talk to him soon. Try not to catastrophize and say one thing necessarily leads to another. You need a new job. That's what we're dealing with. Okay, you're right. I need to take a step back and breathe. I have BPD and OCDs, so catastrophizing tends to be my brain's default mode. I'm not ready to talk to my dad yet, though. I can't even stop crying, let alone hold a coherent conversation with the most judgmental person in my life. Keaton assures me he's on his way to you right now. It's okay to let your emotions out. This is a big loss. I'm about to go out to see him. Thank you for helping to comfort me. I really appreciate it. We are your friends, and we will not abandon you. That's very reassuring to hear. At least I'm not alone in this. Fortunately and unfortunately for her, her living situation did change before the conference, so she was living with a group called the John Brown Volunteers, which is a group in the same vein as CPI, so I won't bother going much into depth about them. In this living arrangement, she would pay rent to Caleb Maupin, roughly 200 bucks a week with her tutoring job and canvassing she would do. With the tutoring gig gone, the caveat with canvassing was that half of earnings from canvassing would go to Maupin, and canvassing doesn't exactly make much money at that, with member 2 estimating maybe a hundred, uh, and at the lowest, thirty dollars a day. To make matters worse, member 2 practically supported the volunteer she was rooming with financially via household expenses. So naturally, when Maupin expected her to keep this up with the power of more canvassing, or uh, not very steady income, she sought real employment, but he wasn't having any of that. Kayla Maupin made it clear to her that it was all or nothing with political advocacy and she'd have to commit full swing. Member 2, we should talk later. But it basically gets down to this. You're in a situation where you know your housing and food will be taken care of. You will not be left out to dry. However, you have some rather unrealistic expectations about other stuff you insist is absolutely need. Your life is your life. Your decisions are your decisions, but you need to figure out how dedicated you are to communism, and if you're ready to leave your old life behind or not. You have one foot in living biologically, and one foot in the revolution, and that's a very hard way to live. I can help you and be your friend, but I cannot solve all of your problems. I cannot make hard choices for you. I won't bother reading out all this religious stuff, but it's basically like, if you don't give up everything for me, then you're not worthy of me. Bring in the jacket. See you at Wendy's at 1 p.m. Spent a long time thinking about you last night. I know these are very hard times for you. Sorry, I'm probably overthinking all this. I just care about you a lot. Spent a long time in prayer. Talk to you soon. I do understand what you're saying, although with all due respect, I think there are certain issues you have had the privilege of not having to deal with, and those pressures are something I'm more than happy to take care of on my own. The reality of it is that I can't just abandon my family. I don't have the privilege of doing that, because I've been their rock for my entire life and they can't do certain things without me. I know it's probably difficult to deal with me having those other obligations, but they are obligations, not choices. There are certain things in my life that aren't optional. I'm sorry that they interfere with my communist activism. If I had the option of forgetting them or leaving them behind, trust me, I would. It would certainly make up my life a whole lot easier. I'm not asking you to abandon your family. We can talk later. There are some things I cannot offer you. I understand. We'll talk later. I find it interesting that he says that he doesn't want her to abandon her family, but post the that religious shit, basically saying you need to abandon your family for me, you know? But, you know, my commentary aside, member two eventually turned to sex work to supplement her income. Not to Kayla Maupin, though, at least not yet. He just supported her decision to do so. Two months after the CPI conference that set this all into motion, she was kicked out of the CPI housing for relapsing on heroin. After this, she started improving herself. She started tutoring again, moved in with her partner, and was getting clean. Sex work was something she still kinda had to do as tutoring wasn't bringing in all the money it used to, and rent at her partner's place was higher than the CPI housing. Entering Maupin again, he offered her two fifty a session to be his dominatrix and needing the money, Member 2 couldn't refuse. Member 2 was now clean, which was what Maupin wanted in order for them to meet up. And while they'd still meet up, 
Maupin was discouraging her from going to events with CPI, saying it would be awkward, but this was a lie. She later found out that Maupin was still spouting the rumor that she was on drugs to other members so they'd be wary of interacting with her isolating her from them. This ensured she couldn't tell anyone that knew Maupin about their dominatrix arrangement, which in fairness to Maupin's excuse would have made it awkward, not to his sex life though, but to his reputation as a whole. Maupin promised to pay a member to buy the dominatrix session, which, by the way, it, yeah, you can guess what happened during those dominatrix sessions. She wasn't just paid by the dominatrix session, but it was also arranged that she would be paid for the sexting they would do. He never paid her for the sexting, and after he was able to use her for his fantasies for a couple months, he cut her off entirely. Now, one thing about the sexting, there was a lot of it. It was so egregious that she would have to tell him to stop because he would try to be dominated while she was tutoring her kids. Here's an example of it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Think you can hold me accountable for my feelings about that book? Absolutely. We'll moderate your detention assignment. You have to write, I must accept my punishment. I need your discipline to grow and be safe 100 times. That is what you are going to say to me when I ask, why are you being punished, Caleb? And if you get that answer wrong, then you clearly haven't learned your lesson, and you'll be punished even more. Thank you, member two. Can you remind me why the boatmaster needed to spank the last duck every day? to keep him from getting lost and hurting himself. The one time he decides to avoid his punishment, he is isolated from his family and almost killed. If the boatmaster doesn't spank the duck, the duck will be like a sailboat without a rudder. Directionless, alone, and nowhere to go. The boatmaster was keeping the duck safe, encouraging them to hurry back, frown. That hard spank with the stick was given in love. I'm so sorry for questioning it, member two. I know I need to get punished. You must be very disappointed in me, frown. If you were my teacher, would I get sent to the paddle for this? Yes, you would. Not because I'm angry with you, but because like Ping, you still haven't learned why you need an authority to guide you with a firm hand. You're smart enough to understand these things, so I have very high expectations of you. Those expectations help you become better, and my discipline helps you meet those expectations. Understood? I need to get a spanking for my little attitude problem. You should probably double the lines I need to write. Frown. You'll be getting double the spankings instead. I'm a proponent of learning while doing. Maybe if you experience Ping's punishment for yourself, you'll lose your attitude. Is it going to hurt to sit down after? Yes, it will. But you still have to sit up straight and deal with the pain. Remember that pain every time you think of questioning my authority. If I see you slouching or changing your posture because you're in pain after I spank you, you'll get paddled instead. Disrespecting that book is kind of like disrespecting you. I must respect authority and discipline. Good posture is essential to good health and productivity. Exactly. Disrespecting any form of authority and discipline is disrespecting me, and I am not forgiving or kind when I am disrespected. My dad should have put me over his knee more often, taught me not to have this disrespectful attitude. You should spank me really hard. Am I going to have to eat soap? If that made you uncomfortable, that's a good thing, you know, shows he got a bit of empathy for someone being exploited. Anyway, it turned out that Member 2 was cut off as a result of Member 1 coming out with allegations first, which had sent Kayla Moppin into a frenzy to call Member 2 a dangerous drug addict to his two-face to the rest of CPI because, I don't know, for some reason he assumed that Member 2 had anything to do with allegations coming out, which she didn't. And Maupin wasn't exactly slick with his intentions either, saying the quiet part out loud with another member of CPI. She's rather two-faced. Member two? Member two. We flirted many times, always consensual. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna be real, I don't know if it is if you gotta clarify that. Isn't she a part of CPI now? As far as I know. She never told me there was any problem. I'm gonna pretend this never happened and cut her off. Strange. We flirt texted on Wednesday, and it was a lot more than verbal abuse. This is dumb shit. And in spite of everything, Member 2 was still supportive of Caleb until one straw finally broke the camel's back. A member of CPI named Joey, also known as the Yankee Tanky, came out with allegations against another member of CPI named Keaton. Desperate for the video to be taken down, Maupin crawled right back to Member 2 trying to get her to convince Joey to take the video down because he had talked about Member 2's personal life in his hit video. Member 2 did have issues with Keaton that were just like Joey had talked about, 
so she figured the video should stay up to expose Keaton for the man he was. And Moppin didn't exactly take kindly to this, calling Member 2 obsessed with the past, which only stood to officially turn her against him. She ends her statement by saying that, if he could callously abuse, manipulate, disregard, and shun a determined group member and close friend after almost half a decade of loyal service, there's no telling what else he's capable of. And while we don't know the extent to what else he's done, we do have the perspective of many former members of CPI, including Member 1 who in the last statement was the first one to come out. Member 1 is being kept anonymous in the article for the same reasons as Member 2. Member 1's statement begins in 2017 when she was 22 years old, having just joined a group known as Students and Youth for a New America, SYNA for short. SYNA was another group founded by Caleb Maupin, and they would host conferences, food drives, laundry drives, cool activist stuff. And since Caleb Maupin had a steady source of income, he was able to spend disposable income on spaces to host these events. Given he was the financial backing to the group, he made sure people got his permission before making activism decisions for themselves, which would be understandable, you know, given he's the leader of the group, so he should have a say in what the group does. And, you know, that's all fine and good, in my opinion at least, if he didn't then subject people who would go and do their own thing to rumors being spread about them. In 2018, Maupin gave Member One news about his fascination with the world of spanking, and his own experiences with it growing up, citing being spanked in school, and also being bullied growing up, which, you know, who could have guessed this guy was bullied in school? More detail, though, was that he would see a dominatrix twice a month to get spanked, which wasn't Member 2, she didn't start spanking him until 2021. Member 1 was put off by this, but like Member 2 had, the red flags were misinterpreted as being friendly and maybe a little awkward. What went too far, though, to Member 1 was when she was also told by Maupin about his tendency to ask women about their experiences with spanking and how he would later get off on it, much to her disgust. A manipulator trick Maupin would do on Member 1 was to bash himself for being socially awkward so she would be forgiving of his tendency to bring up spanking in conversations. And while she wasn't entirely forgiving, she wrote more than once about trying to have empathy for him on account of his awkwardness at the time. A pattern of behavior emerges again, with Maupin having a tendency to gossip to group members separately to get them to think less of each other, which culminated in group members rarely talking without Maupin around. This matters because this is why Member 1 was hesitant to ask Maupin to calm the spanking talk down since he could easily then kill her reputation with the other group members, knowing how he would shit-talk the other members with her. 2019 came around and Maupin wasn't exactly any better with his habit of talking about spanking. He had hatched the idea of a social media coach and would always talk about it, and while that sounds like something an influencer of Maupin's size would reasonably look into, you're not even gonna guess what he wanted the coach to do. That's right. He would want the coach to shame him for not being big enough on social media and to spank him for it and make him pay. Monetarily, that is. Member 1, not being a complete fucking idiot, knew what this was and would always try to deflect this idea whenever he'd bring it up, even trying to lead him to an app where he could find someone else to do that for him. And it was starting to get annoying, but Maupin would always pull the you're such a good friend act out to get her to feel bad uh, when she would be annoyed. Eventually, on April 17th, Maupin sent this message to Member 1, where he says he's going to bring up the social media coach idea casually to an old roommate. Bottom until it's red and bruised doesn't arouse you, so you won't do it with passion. Right, and I know there are things too, like financial domination and stuff, but yeah, I'm not very passionate about it. So in the end, I felt like I would be wasting their time and money and I would go through a lot of effort for something that makes me feel gross, because I had imagined most clients are not young or attractive. My old roommate, she seemed interested in some of this. I'm gonna casually bring up the social media discipline thing when I see her next week. Not directly ask her, but casually bring it up. See how she reacts. Which, uh, fucking slick. Yeah, nothing to lose. I can't do that for you, just so you know. Only because you have mentioned it to me. Lol lol lol, I wasn't propositioning you, don't worry, we are comrades. I don't bring this stuff into politics. 
Her honest reaction to that information was to tell him that she had no interest in being his prostitute. Moppin ended this interaction by complimenting Member One on how great of a worker she is, escaping Member One actually thinking about what he was doing by flattering her. From then on, he would talk more about political topics, though one time he did try to bring up his dominatrix stuff casually just a couple days after those last messages. It can't be confirmed for sure, but she seems to believe that he would constantly bring it up to make her insensitive to it and more likely to do it for him, which, hey, I believe it, I hope you guys do too, this seems like a pattern of behavior with this guy. On May 1st, all expense paid trips to Venezuela were being offered to go and protest the presidency of the recently elected at the time, Juan Guaido. At the time, for political reasons, the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela was being threatened with cut power and American diplomats were leaving, so safe to say, tensions were pretty high and it wouldn't be the greatest idea for an American to go there. Given most of SYNA's action was done in the U.S. and more particularly NYC, it was out of character for Moppin to just demand members of SYNA drop their commitments and head over to Venezuela. He would pressure members to go to Venezuela, and that's bad, but what's even worse is that he himself wouldn't even go because he had a comfy job to stay at and write articles and travel the world and be a big communist revolutionary leader and the whole world has done everything to block me from doing that i sold my blood plasma i got mistreated for years in wwp and now i have a nice comfortable job i'm well known comparatively speaking I don't get it. Here, I'm practically begging people to do what I've fought to do my whole life. The door is wide open and people don't want it. Why did I have to fight so hard to do what other people don't even care enough to do? My deepest apologies. I can't speak for others and I've already explained that I care about my personal safety. It's not an issue of apologizing. You didn't do anything wrong. You just aren't like me. I know I didn't do anything wrong. Okay then. Those messages were sent at 1 in the morning, and 30 minutes after being rejected, he blew Member One's phone up with messages chastising her for not wanting to go to Venezuela. The next two hours was an argument between the two, Moppin trying his best to manipulate her into going, which never worked. Of note are these messages between them. Venezuela is that you don't think you'll be able to call the US Embassy. You never understood what SYNA was about. And if you're scared of being put on a list, you really should stay the fuck away from me. It's pathetic after all the time and money I've contributed to SYNA that this is what you chose to start your attack on me over. It's not an attack on you! You have lulled me into thinking you are someone I can whine to about my problems with. You gained my trust. You got me to open up to you. Uh, well, you included me in your problems, which I don't support. So I was opening up! Yeah, real manipulative shit. Throughout the conversation, neither person's perspective changed, even though Member One was trying her best not to end up blocked. This was because, in total, she has spotted him $157 over the course of them knowing each other, because Caleb Moppin was always running out of money, and she knew if she was blocked, then she wasn't getting that shit back. In the SYNA group chat, Member One posted the logs of the argument, which no one supported her because they had no clue what the fuck was going on, and of course, she was promptly kicked by Moppin. With that, she was out, and despite other members' confusion at who they thought was such a hard-working member, they never spoke out against it. And since Caleb Moppin ran the whole operation, Member One's time with SYNA was over. Member One holds the opinion that she doesn't find it to be a coincidence that Moppin started a huge argument with her conveniently right after she turned down any possibility of herself spanking him. The time frame of the great spanking rejection and the Venezuela argument was like two weeks so not that much time. Naturally, it makes sense he would then just find something to rile her up over and have an excuse to kick her out since she no longer had a chance of being of service to him. After Member One's ejection, when people who knew her asked where she went, Moppin would make up different stories about her having alcoholism to discredit her and try to explain away her leaving. There were inconsistencies found in his stories, though. Some were told that she quit because she was an alcoholic, and others that she was kicked out because she was too distracted being an alcoholic, and yeah, she was kicked out. You know, for reference, Member One does not and has not struggled with alcoholism. In March of 2019, 
One month before the great spanking rejection, Member 1 noticed a new member of CPI was getting more attention from Moppin than usual. The thought had entered Member 1's head that this new member was going to be put through the spank talk ringer, or that they would even be abused. Their thoughts were not inaccurate, as this member turned out to be Member 2, whose statement was read right before this one. Since nothing bad had actually happened at this point, Member 1 never warned Member 2, and she never learned of how bad it really was until they connected to write this article against him. Member 1's guilt still consumes her, but as she put it, I would have seemed crazy if I warned them. As I've said, there are many other perspectives laid out in this article from others that entail the same manipulative patterns of behavior from Caleb Maupin. And I will be linking the Medium article in the description just so you can make sure I'm not misrepresenting anything that these victims said. Though, be aware, it's a pretty long and quite upsetting read. One man spanking kink led others down horrible paths that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Regardless of political opinions, this is disgusting behavior and has no place in advocacy. I don't even agree with the politics of the people who wrote this, but that does not make their stories less valid. But what if I told you it doesn't even end here? After this article dropped, CPI met and elected to expel Caleb Maupin on account of his misdeeds. It sounds like a bit of accountability being taken by the organization against such an evil person. CPI even dissolved itself. That's how accountable they were being, right? Well, it turns out that three months after the article was published, Moppin made a video titled, Time to Finally Talk About What Happened. And yes, I had to watch it. The shit I do for you guys. They were determined to go public with this document. Why? Clout. They wanted to get more likes, more shares, more Facebook views, more attention. I would have preferred to keep this private, but it is now all over the internet. Now, spanking isn't just my deep, dark personal secret, it's America's deep, dark secret. 19 U.S. states still allow for corporal punishment in public schools. Furthermore, the way we practice corporal punishment in Anglo countries has a particularly sexual undertone to it. Pain is inflicted on a specific part of the body. It often includes forced nudity and other humiliation. I will link the video below just so you can be sure I won't misrepresent anything he said in this 26 minute response video, though be warned it won't make a lot of sense if you haven't read the entire hit article. So back to CPI. It's back, and Caleb Maupin is the leader once again. The previous solution was only performative and just for everyone else to get the illusion of accountability from them. In the video Maupin made in response, he sums up all the accusations up to bringing his personal life into politics and having conversations with consenting adults, which I don't think is the best of summaries given what we just heard. He gets to the point of even being conspiratorial about these allegations against him. Well, I brought my personal life into a political space and I shouldn't have done that. And to everyone who was affected by that, I deeply apologize. I've taken time off to get the help I need to make sure I do not make this mistake again. But let me emphasize, all that I'm accused of is a few interactions, mostly conversations, with consenting adults. It's pretty clear this whole situation is being manipulated by outside forces, but we'll get to that later. And it's pretty clear these people had some assistance in putting together this piece in order to frame me in the most negative light, but avoid me suing them for defamation. The video is all over the place in ways that it really shouldn't be. He claims that the people who wrote the article were being manipulated by outside forces, and this is a claim he just has no source for. This is just something he said to implant as much doubt in the heads of the people watching as possible. Now isn't it interesting that just hours after this document was published, Daria Dugana, the daughter of Alexander Dugan, was murdered by a car bomb. Isn't it interesting that the Communist Party USA had a resolution condemning me all prepared to send out the very next day after this document was published? The random outside forces tangent would have been the most ridiculous claim in the video, but then he goes on another tangent about how it's so interesting that the article released just as a political assassination happened, which is an interesting tie to draw if you're trying to make people think that you're a fine and normal and not conspiratorial person who's absolutely not running any cults based on any political hysteria. Now one of the most common claims that's been floating around is the allegation that somehow CPI was a quote sex cult. Well the accusers themselves, the people who put this document together, were the first to speak up and say that that's not the case. 
Well, I appreciate that from them, but they know how the internet works. As soon as this was published, immediately every anti-China, anti-Russia, bread tube troll jumped on it and made it into something that it wasn't. And they publish it online and people see it and they get grossed out and they look away. Rape is rape. Sexual assault is sexual assault. But I'm not accused of anything like that in this document. When it really gets down to it, this document doesn't really accuse me of very much at all. Amid all the innuendo about me being an evil, manipulative cult leader, all that they claim I did was engage in consensual interactions with two consenting adults, most of which were just conversations. Uh, and he also plays the pedantry card by saying that the document never explicitly called him a sex cultist, and so it would be inappropriate to call him that. And this is true. The article never actually does call him a sex cultist, though he did exhibit a, quite a bit of cult-like behavior and had very strange sexual exchanges using his position of power over his subordinates. Treating political activism like an in-group to maintain exclusivity over and isolating your own members to take advantage of them while they're alone is some pretty cultish shit and I'd hope you guys would agree. Now, in addition to the sex drama, the document goes on to imply a number of things that are just not true. Uh, one of the biggest false narratives in the document involves an unnamed person who is referred to as a heroin addict and a sex worker. Now, this document gives the impression that this person never would have been a sex worker, never would have relapsed in their heroin addiction if it wasn't for me. The document basically says that I maniacally conspired to make this person lose their job, to make this person relapse on their heroin addiction, all so I could have them right where I want them. He does many other things here which make no sense, such as trying to say that he was accused of being the reason for Member 2's heroin relapse. At no point in the video did I hint that Moppin was responsible for this relapse, and that's because the article didn't do that either. I didn't even have that idea in my head until he said it, and something makes me doubt you guys thought that as well. I personally had thought the relapse was just something that happened separate from the living conditions Member 2 was in, but seeing Moppin so defensive over something that was never even said is making me reconsider. If I were to go over the whole response video, which by the way the victims did, and I will be linking that article in the description, this video would be way longer than it needs to be. And I think it's important to center the victims' voices in instances like this. And I think that the most important thing to go over was what happened to them before the dissolution of CPI. With CPI being back from this quote-unquote dissolution, it's almost like nothing ever happened and Moppin's doing just as fine as ever, which is just disgusting to think of. I'm not saying Moppin is still talking about spanking with CPI members, but if more were to come out again down the line, well, I wouldn't exactly be surprised. I hope you guys know now that Caleb Moppin is a hack of an activist, a failed author, and most importantly, the communist YouTuber that ran a spanking cult. I have been John X. Woodcat, and that's about it. I'll see you in the next video. I think you can hold me. <laughs> I can't. <laughs>